Okay, let's get started. Um, so today's lecture is uh, continuing the topic of magnetism. Uh, last time we covered magnetism, which uh, comes from um, uh, non-ordered uh, system of spins. So we just included the fact that we have two spin subsystems in a solid, spin up and spin down. And then when we apply a magnetic field, then can, they can generate magnetization either in the direction of the field or opposite direction. And those are the cases of paramagnetism and diamagnetism. And we saw that um, a lot of the times it's the actual atom, the atomic structure of the material that determines whether you have a paramagnet or a diamagnet, right? But also, uh, if you just consider a model such as a, a Sommerfeld free electron gas, that can generate paramagnetism and diamagnetism as well. Uh, today is about magnetic order. So what I mean by magnetic order is that spontaneously, or under the influence, in fact, of some interactions, all or many of the spins in a system line up in the same direction. And uh, that can happen even without any external magnetic field. So there is a spin order, magnetic order, in the material. Uh, one example of that uh, is a magnet that is attached to your fridge, right, in your kitchen. Uh, that is an example of a ferromagnet. And the, 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 the most common example of that material is iron. There are a couple of ferromagnets that are single elemental ferromagnets, such as iron, nickel, cobalt, are all ferromagnetic materials, and they magnetize. So you're familiar with them from your daily life. You're familiar with them from your physics, physics two, I guess. Um, and uh, what's uh, behind this ferromagnetism is exactly this spontaneous arrangement of spins, spontaneous alignment of spins, spontaneous magnetic order, uh, which makes uh, um, a chunk of material into a magnetic dipole because all the spins are pointing in the same directions. Their magnetic fields that they create add up to a large measurable field that you can uh, detect outside or you can uh, have two magnets uh, coupled to each other. Uh, so that's so interactions are uh, the key. And in case of ferromagnetism, in particular, the arrangement of spins is all in the same direction, parallel to each other. That's a ferromagnetism. So uh, today we are going to consider situations where spins are localized to crystal lattice sites. So we are not going to consider spins that are moving. We will look at that uh, on Thursday in the next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to consider uh, spins of electrons that are trapped on lattice sites. Uh, so they, they couple by uh, some kind of interactions nonetheless, but they're not allowed to move uh, from site to site. Uh, and in this kind of uh, framework, Ferromagnetism is a structure like this. All of the spins are uh, lined in the same direction. Now, typically, this is due to some kind of interaction between these spins. And this interaction uh, is characterized by a, an energy scale. So uh, if you give system extra internal energy by increasing temperature, for example, this order will be destroyed. So at high enough temperature, spins will randomize. They will point in any direction they like because they have enough thermal energy to overcome this coupling energy that makes them all line up in the same direction. It tells them that they prefer to minimize their energy to be all in the same direction. And uh, then there will be a certain temperature below which it is no longer um, it becomes favorable to line them all up in the same direction. And that is, for the ferromagnet, that's called the Curie temperature, after Pierre Curie. Okay. So,
So what is the Hamiltonian that gives this interaction? It is called a Heisenberg Hamiltonian. So Heisenberg Hamiltonian is coupling of spins with a coupling J. So once again, these are spin-spin interactions, but spins are not allowed to move in this case. They are stationary. And um, these uh, triangular brackets here, these triangular brackets here in the sum, mean that we only concern ourselves with nearest neighbor spins. Ne nearest neighbor spins couple with this energy J. Uh, all the other spins are uncoupled. So this is the simplest Heisenberg model. Uh, in uh, one dimension, that would be called the Heisenberg chain. And you can see that uh, if you have a Hamiltonian like this, uh, for positive J, you will see that spins will prefer to be in the same direction. Right? To minimize energy, the ground state of the system, minimum energy state, will be all the spins lined up in the same direction. So when SI and SJ are both negative or both positive, energy is minimized. Uh, you uh, can also add a magnetic uh, energy, so Zeeman energy that uh, couples to a single spin, and that will break the symmetry between all spins lining up and all spins lining down, right? So one of these configurations will be preferred over the other in a magnetic field. In zero field, they're both equally uh, uh, advantageous, but all the spins have to be lined up in the same direction. Now we will see uh, today that uh, in a real material, uh, we hardly ever have a situation where all the spins in the material are lined up in the same direction. We will have a, a region of a material where spins are pointing this way, and then another region where spins are pointing down. Um, that, those are called domains, and that's coming up. Um, I should also say that this model of stationary spins uh, is uh, very useful and describes many materials, but it's not the only thing you can have. So Electrons that are mobile, electrons in a conduction band, for example, have their own magnetism, and that's called itinerant ferromagnetism. Uh, that's because these electrons are movable, and that also comes from interactions between those electrons. Uh, that will be, uh, we will study that in the next lecture. Okay. That was ferromagnet. There is also something called antiferromagnet. Uh, from the point of view of the Hamiltonian, uh, it is a very similar Hamiltonian. Who can tell me what is the difference with the ferromagnet? Does not have a negative sign in front, right? So J is still positive, but this energy is now uh, increased when spins are lined up in the same direction, right? So if you imagine a chain of sites like this, um, and let's say the first one is pointing up, then energy is minimized when the second one is pointing down, and the third one is pointing up, and they go alternating like this forever. That's the ground state of an antiferromagnet. So you can see that each nearest neighbor pair is anti-aligned, and therefore, this energy is minimized. And that is the case for each pair. So the total energy of the system is minimized when they are anti-aligned like that. So that's an example of an anti-ferromagnetism. You can also construct an anti-ferromagnetic arrangement on a 2D lattice. So for example, a square lattice. That's easy. Again, we pick one site. Spin points up, then the two nearest neighbors of this site, spin has to point the other way, pointing down. Then the nearest neighbors of these guys have to point all up, and so on, alternating spin arrangements everywhere in a 2D. Now, here's a tricky, here's a tricky situation. What about a Diagonal lattice. 
right? So we have a triagonal lattice. Let's do the same trick. Uh, let's put one of the spins up. So the nearest neighbor has to be down. This one, that's the, that's the tricky one. Does this one line up or does it line down? Right, so it's the nearest neighbor side to one spin up and one spin down. And you, know, it, it, you can uh, go on. So there, this is called a frustrated system. So this system is frustrated, doesn't know where it wants to line up or down. And that gives rise to a lot of fascinating physics. Uh, and a very simple uh, way to generate that is to just put spins on a triagonal lattice and turn on this Hamiltonian with a positive sign and you have generated a frustrated magnet. Frustration. So that is, frustration is a technical term here. Uh, okay, so this was uh, envisioned by Louis Nail uh, in France uh, in the 1930s. Um, he predicted this and I think did some measurement, measurements on this. Uh, materials that tend to be antiferromagnetic are uh, some of the oxides of the magnetic materials, uh, some of the more complex and relevant for modern uh, physics uh, materials are also antiferromagnetic in some reg regions of their phase diagram, such as the famous cuprate materials, which are high temperature superconductors. Um, not so easy to measure this, right? So uh, in a ferromagnet, you, are, you can measure it with uh, just the door of your fridge, right? So it, you, can, you know that there is magnetization in that. All the spins are lined up in the same direction. There is a gigantic Tesla scale magnetic field outside of the ferromagnet, easy to detect. This one, net magnetization is zero, right? Net magnetization, let's say, on a square lattice or in a chain, net magnetization is zero. So you cannot really measure magnetic field outside of this. So there are more subtle ways that you can actually measure this. And the transition temperature in this case is not called the Curie temperature, it's called nail temperature after the guy who uh, first introduced these ferromagnets. Antiferromagnets, sorry. Okay, there is also something called ferry magnetism. And that is uh, an interesting state. Um, Imagine that you have um, a, a lattice which is uh, some kind of a lattice that has a sub-lattice. So this, I just use a hexagonal lattice because we remember that this is two triagonal lattices uh, put together. So it's a lattice with, uh, with a sub-lattice. And imagine that... Um, all the, imagine that the two atoms in the sublattice are actually different, not like in graphene where they're all the same, but sublattice A atoms have large spins, and then sublattice B atoms have smaller, smaller magnetic moments, and those smaller ones are actually pointing in the opposite direction. So this is what's called a ferry magnetism. Now, with ferry magnetism is really hard to classify it, but that's why it's its own, its own class, but you can still ask, is it closer to ferromagnetism or to antiferromagnetism? On the one hand, you can see that the nearest neighbors are arranged in the opposite directions. And so this is like an antiferromagnetism. On the other hand, there is, in this case, a net magnetic moment. That's because the larger spin is not fully compensated by the smaller magnetic moment, and so there is a net magnetization. And so in this sense, it is like a ferromagnet. You can actually measure the magnetization of, in this case, although it is sm generally smaller than in the case of a uh, ferromagnet. And there are other types of magnetic order. So uh, give you a couple more examples here. So the ones that we... Uh, just considered are this upper uh, line here. Uh, and um, most of them have, in some sense, non-zero magnetization. Um, 
in, for an anti-ferromagnet, the total average magnetization is zero. But if you look at one of the sort of sublattices of this, one of the spin sublattices, it, there is a large magnetization. Uh, there are more exotic orders, uh, like a helix, where as you go along the crystal, magnetization winds, uh, makes a helical uh, magnetic order, or a canted case where spins are not perfectly anti-parallel, but they are, uh, they have a certain uh, cant to them. And in all these cases, the Magnetization is not zero, and clearly from these pictures, these are all examples of magnetic order. We will mostly look at ferromagnets today. Now, a few words about how to detect this. So, um, one way to do this is by measuring the magnetic susceptibility of your compound. So, first let's look at the paramagnetic trace. Uh, this is this 1 over T dependence of susceptibility. So remember, susceptibility uh, is a proportionality constant between uh, magnetization and magnetic field. Right? So the susceptibility for different compounds behaves differently. Uh, and that also uh, has a deep connection to this phase transition physics. Uh, which we probably don't have time to cover, but uh, if you go on with science, you will certainly encounter that uh, uh, at some point. So the paramagnetic case, that's the susceptibility proportional to 1 over temperature, and that, remember, we introduced it called the Curie law. So this is what you get for a system of uh, spins which are sitting at atoms and uh, don't interact with each other, uh, and you just calculate the magnetization as a function of temperature in a certain field. Um, that's called the Curie law. Now, uh, for the other two cases, anti-ferromagnetic and ferromagnetic, there are these critical temperatures, right? So there is a Curie temperature, there's a Curie point and a nail point, uh, and susceptibility behaves differently on one side, on the high temperature side of the uh, Curie point and on the low temperature side of the critical point. Um, on the high temperature side, in all three cases, you have this 1 over T law, uh, and that is that means that all of these compounds tend to be paramagnetic above the critical temperature, above this uh, critical point. Um, and this makes sense because um, in order to generate a magnetic order, either aligned or anti-aligned or some other, first of all, you need to have magnetic moments to begin with. And when you have magnetic moments, remember when J is not zero in an atom or when S is not zero, uh, when the shell is partially filled in an atom, whenever this is the case, uh, you have a paramagnet. You only have a diamagnet for a filled shell, and the diamagnet is created from the orbital uh, magnetic moments and so on, right? So you, whenever you have some moments, you have a paramagnet, and that's why it, it looks like the black traces show that it looks like it behaves like a paramagnet, and then at a certain temperature, starts to do something different. So in fact, uh, in the case of a ferromagnet, uh, there is a rapid increase in susceptibility at the Curie point, and then beyond that, where it's shown in green here, behavior is actually very complex. So this green line is not really what it's, not necessarily what it does. We will see in the, in the upcoming slides that the range of behaviors as you sweep magnetic field for a ferromagnet can be uh, fairly complicated depending on the materials details, the disorder in the material and so on. Um, and in the case of an anti-ferromagnet, there is this cusp and in principle, this cusp can be measured. So you can measure susceptibility as a function of temperature, you know, change magnetic field, measure magnetization, and you will see that in an anti-ferromagnetic state, uh, there is still some susceptibility to magnetic field, but it drops with temperature. So a very characteristic behavior. Um, now, this cusp and this divergence are signatures of a phase transition. So whenever 
property like uh, susceptibility has a kink or a divergence, that's where you have a phase transition. I don't want to go deeper into this. This is beyond the scope of this lecture and maybe of the entire course. Uh, it is a, its own field of science and physics. The physics of phase transitions can be given an entire semester or even two semesters worth of material just on that. Uh, and it's very useful to know some of the basics of that. And maybe you've had some of it in your thermodynamics or statistical physics. Uh, but in this case, I just give you this example. Now, uh, measuring susceptibility is rather tedious. Uh, and so there is another way that you will recognize uh, as a viable approach to measuring antiferromagnetic order. So like I said, there is no net magnetization. But uh, remember I told you that you can do diffraction experiments with neutrons. So imagine you have a crystal which entered the antiferromagnetic state and all the spins are lined up anti-parallel. And imagine you are um, exposing it to a beam of neutron particles. Now neutrons will uh, diffract off of this crystal and will give diffraction peaks, right? And from the diffraction peaks, remember you can learn the, the lattice constant and the crystal structure, whether it's cubic or Trigonal or BCC or FCC and so on. You can learn all this information. But another thing that about neutron is that neutrons have spin. And these moments, these magnetic moments of neutrons will interact with the magnetic moments of a lattice. And so for neutrons, these atoms here will be different from the unshaded ones. So spin-up atoms will be different from spin-down atoms. And so neutrons uh, of each subspin will interfere only with the atoms of you know, the same spin. They will interfere in different ways in any case. And so neutrons, uh, due to their spins, will see that the unit cell of this square lattice is like this. So if you ignore spin, the unit cell is just a square, right? And it's A. And the unit cell will be different if you distinguish spins. So you can imagine cooling down through the nail transition, through the critical temperature, and going from a diffraction pattern of neutrons consistent with a peri periodicity A for this particular material to a larger periodicity uh, given in the antiferromagnetic state, and you can detect the antiferromagnetic transition uh, this way. Okay. So now let's uh, focus on ferromagnets and uh, think about um, how would you actually make all the spins in a ferromagnet line up in the same direction? So the way you do it is typically you go above this critical temperature, above the Curie temperature. For some materials like iron, you have to go above room temperature, right? Because iron, you know, magnetizes to your fridge door at room temperature and therefore uh, it is already below the Curie temperature at room temperature. Some other materials you may have to, you may be above Curie temperature at room temperature, but not for iron. So you have to actually heat it up. Um, and then you cool it down in a magnetic field. And then you can be sure that the spins will line up in the same direction. This is how you uh, sort of train or anneal a magnet. Uh, now, um, if you do this uh, very slowly, then you will give uh, spins a chance to all line up in the same direction. If you do it quickly, uh, you may uh, break a perfect arrangement of spins into domains of a certain spin orientation. And so this is an example from Wikipedia of magnetic domains. So this is a magnetic sample, and uh, these stripes are the um, 
MFM signal. I'll show you what that is in a moment. Magnetic microscopy signal, which shows the uh, different orientation of magnetization in different parts of the sample. And so those are called domains. And uh, another important thing is that they are separated by domain walls. So inside a domain wall, magnetization goes from pointing in one direction to pointing in another direction. And so inside a domain wall, magnetization is reduced. Uh, those domain walls tend to play a very critical role. Right? And you can see that that in this specimen, the domain walls form some kind of an erratic random pattern. So they're often um, due to some kind of defect, some kind of disorder in the material. Although it is possible also to create a perfectly lined up domain walls. And this is what people uh, like to do in magnetic storage uh, devices, for example. Uh, they want to control the domain size and the domain shape. Okay. So um, when you um, go through the transition quickly, the technical term for that is quenching, and this GIF file shows what happens as you quench a system of spins. Uh, so initially, the pattern was that each color, black and white, is spin up or spin down on a, on a big grid, something like 500 by 500 spins, like that. And then you start going through the magnetic transition, uh, for example, by lowering temperature in a fixed field or by just lowering temperature in zero field, then um, nearby spins prefer to line up in the same direction. And that's why you start uh, nucleating these large areas of the same color. Uh, but uh, due to some randomness in the, in the coupling or some defects, uh, they form these patterns uh, which are exactly the domains. So this is an example of a quench. Um, and so this is just to tell you that, uh, not just to tell you that uh, things are simply not perfect, uh, in real samples that magnetization is not uniform. This actually is critical for there being any kind of non-zero magnetization, as I will show you, uh, show you in a moment. So let's first uh, uh, introduce a little bit better the domain wall. Um, so um, in zero magnetic field, uh, a ferromagnet would, in principle, on a large scale, prefer to have uh, zero total magnetization uh, just simply because um, it will cost a lot of energy to flip all the spins in the same direction uh, in, if there are any kind of, uh, if you include any kind of real system effects like finite size or uh, disorder uh, stuff. But uh, the uh, situation is never as simple as there being a region of all the spins pointing up and then another region of all the spins pointing down. Well, the average is zero, but locally within a domain there is a ferromagnetic arrangement. Uh, why is this situation not favorable? That's because you have uh, these two spins anti-aligned and so you have to pay this energy J, which can be quite a bit, and the system doesn't like that. Um, so a compromise is to uh, gradually rotate the orientation of uh, magnetization from one side to the other. Um, and this is uh, then resulting in a finite size of the domain wall, domain wall uh, of a size L. So when the magnetization is rotated, uh, like is shown on the screen, uh, that is called uh, Neel type domain wall. You can also uh, rotate magnetization out of the plane like this. So here is one domain on the left, all spins pointing down, and then you can rotate magnetization out of the plane and then uh, go into the pointing up. And that's called the Bloch domain wall. And the nail domain wall is you start with down and you are in the same plane rotating uh, this way along in the plane that goes along the domain wall. 
Uh, there are some subtle differences between these two. Uh, for today's discussion, it will actually not be important which type of domain wall we consider, uh, NEL or BLOCK. But I just wanted you to know that there are two types possible. Now, let's try to calculate what is the uh, characteristic size of the domain wall. So like I told you, uh, a sharp domain wall like is shown on the left is hugely energetically unfavorable because energy you have to pay to have two spins anti-aligned in a ferromagnet next to each other is very large. It's J times S squared. So the magnetic moments of the two, of the two sites, um, uh, S does not have to be spin one half, can be something bigger. Um, now, uh, the way to uh, minimize this energy is to can't spin a little bit at a time as you go from one lattice side to the other. And then the energy you pay going from spin up to spin a little bit tilted is a smaller energy. So in this case, <coughs> the energy cost going by one uh, period here uh, would be something like Js squared and then uh, something like 1 minus cosine uh, of this angle. Uh, cosine uh, square. No, cosine. 1 minus cosine of this angle. Right? So this, is, uh, this would be the energy going from one link of the chain to the other, but it's the same energy going from the second to the third. If we rotate them all by the fixed angle theta, uh, then, um, if you do this n times, then you can tell that theta is pi divided by n. And if uh, theta is a small angle, or n is a large number, you can expand this cosine to be 1 uh, plus theta squared over 2, and so on. So, uh, you will end up with this term pi divided by n squared, uh, and uh, there will be n of these terms, right? because the domain wall is of the size n, uh, and uh, each time uh, you pay the energy proportional to theta squared. Theta is a small number, which is pi over n. So this is the kind of energy cost you pay in this case. So you can see that this energy cost is 1 over n times smaller than the energy cost you pay when you sharply flip spin by pi, rotate magnetization by pi. Um, now, if we just consider this one, one contribution here in red at the top, uh, then uh, it would seem that the domain wall should just stretch forever, we take the entire sample, right? We just grow n, and we make uh, theta smaller and smaller, and this energy goes to zero. It does not cost anything uh, to have this domain, which is of infinite size. So we have to introduce another term to explain the finite size domains. And that term uh, is this term, uh, which is the anisotropy term. Uh, so <coughs> the anisotropy term is due to the fact that you are in a ferromagnet. And uh, uh, spins do want to be pointing in the same direction. Uh, by some kind of geometry constraint or by crystal fields. Uh, so this is an additional term. Um, and together, they make an equation where uh, you have a term that shrinks with n, and you have another term with a k anisotropy constant, which is material and sample design specific. This term grows with n. And so you can find the domain wall size by minimizing this function. This is how you can find a domain wall size. So you take a derivative of this uh, energy cost with n, uh, and you find that indeed there is an n which, for which a minimum energy is reached. You pay the minimum cost, uh, and that n is uh, made up of the constants that we put in the model, the magnetic moment, the uh, coupling J between the two spins and the anisotropy constant, 
Um, and for a typical material like, say, iron, when you put in the numbers J, S, and K for iron, um, you will find that the domain wall can be as large as 150 lattice constants. So this spin slowly cans over 150 uh, lattice sites. And that's that's a, that's a pretty typical number for, for many, many ferromagnets. Okay. So we have domain walls. Now, fine, very good. We have domains. Um, let's say we have uh, an un annealed uh, ferromagnet, untrained ferromagnet, where uh, the average magnetization over the entire material is zero, uh, like this case here. Uh, suppose we apply magnetic field to this system. Um, well, nothing prevents it from just redistributing the domain sizes uh, to adjust for this field. So the field is pointing up. That means spin up is preferred. So let's just increase the sizes of all the spin up domains and shrink at the same time at the cost of the, increase them at the cost of the spin down domains. And so then there will be a net magnetization uh, induced by magnetic field here. But this is then no different from a paramagnet. Right? So there is zero magnetization on average zero magnetization when there is zero magnetic field and in magnetic field there is some magnetization so you can describe it as a paramagnet with some susceptibility domain sizes will uh, adjust themselves according to the susceptibility um, of course if you look closely inside the material you will find these regions of magnetic order but you certainly cannot explain the behavior of the same example I keep giving you the fridge magnet you cannot explain the fact that at zero magnetic field, there is a magnetization. Right? Because in this case, essentially there isn't. You have to look very closely to see it on the scale of the domain size. So what comes to uh, rescue here is uh, imperfections in the material, actually. Imperfections in the material is what makes magnets stick to fridge doors. Uh, and this is how it works. Uh, we need to prevent magnetic domain walls from moving. We need to pin them at fixed locations to prevent this scenario. Uh, and in a perfect crystal, perfect crystal with no defects in infinite system, that's not possible. Domain walls are very mobile. But in a crystal with defects, it's possible. So we look at um, these cartoons at the top now. Um, here, uh, I uh, draw it uh, such that the domain wall size is just one site to exaggerate the picture, right? We just discussed that it can be 150 sites. Here is just one site. And so each of these red links is extremely expensive in terms of energy because on each of the red links, we have this very sharp domain wall and spins are anti-aligned in a ferromagnet this costs you a lot of energy to have this. Uh, and so system desperately wants to, uh, to not have to have this situation. Um, and you can count the number of links here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 12 links. Uh, that's the cost of 12J times S squared. Um, and now this green dot in the middle is a defect. So this is a defect where there is no magnetic moment. There is no magnetic moment. So if the domain wall runs through this defect, you can see that there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 rather than 12. So you have less energy cost if the domain wall passes through this defect. So you save some energy by uh, going like this. And that means that the domain wall will maybe travel around and until it encounters a defect, and then it will be stuck to this defect. It will be pinned. 
And this uh, is a very, very important uh, effect. So why is this an important effect? Um, because uh, imagine you have a lot of defects. Imagine you have a lot of defects, and that means that uh, whatever the domain walls you have in your material, they're all pinned. Not, no domains move. And so you have these uh, clusters of uh, constant polarization in the material randomly created, like in the first picture I showed you of a ferromagnet with domains. Uh, in this case, fairly random orientation. Uh, and the, the domain walls are, are pinned uh, in their places. Uh, then, if you make the field very, very large, you can certainly make all of these domains line up in the same direction. Huge energy. And if you make the field large in the other direction, you can line them up all in the other direction. And the magnetization will reach saturation at large field because all the magnetic moments are aligned and there is nothing else to magnetize. Everything is magnetized in the same direction. And so you keep, keep increasing magnetic field, but the magnetization does not drop. But now let's think about what happens <coughs> at lower fields. Let's say you uh, start at high field and everything is magnetized you start dropping the field and you can in fact go all the way to zero field. So all the way to zero field. Uh, so in principle there is nothing that tells all these magnetic moments that they should be pointing in the same direction. Right? But uh, which one of them would, would prefer to flip? They're all already magnetized in the same direction and so flipping one is just means creating a lot of extra energy cost at the domain wall boundaries. So each domain wall boundary between different magnetizations immediately begins to cost you energy because you go from pointing one way to pointing another way. And so this will actually not happen at zero field if you come from large field. You have to make some extra incentive for these domains to start flipping. So you have to overshoot. You have to go in the more negative direction with your field uh, until you start flipping some domains because they are no longer favoring pointing all in the same direction because that costs too much Zeeman energy. Zeeman energy prefers that they point in the other direction. So some of them will start flipping and saying, fine, I will pay the energy cost of having a, a domain wall, but just uh, please let me flip. So, um, you go in a negative direction and magnetization starts to drop and actually at finite negative field is where you have zero total magnetization and uh, magnetic domains all pointing in, in, in random directions. Right, so once again, uh, this would not be possible if domain walls were mobile. If we could just readjust the sizes of domains continuously it would cost only very little energy to slightly grow the domains as we increase magnetic field. Only when they're pinned and the domain wall has to be here at this point. Only in this case we have this situation. And this is uh, known as the hysteresis loop. So hysteresis loop means that you, uh, the system interestingly has a memory of how it got to this state. Right? So in a power magnet, you turn on the magnetic field and you turn it back off, magnetization disappears. And you can make the field negative, positive, rotate it like this in any way you like and then bring it back to zero and all of that information is lost. Here, you can see that it's important how you got to the field. So for example, you start here and you decrease the field, you may uh, end up with a finite positive magnetization. If you start from negative field and you decrease, increase the field to zero, you will have a large uh, opposite magnetization. So 
history of the system is stored uh, in the final state. And this is why magnetism can be used to store information. And so you can write in magnetization up or down into a little domain. And this is actually how hard drives operate. So you, they have, um, they divide a disk into many, many domains. Uh, and then they uh, write information into them in up or down in the hysteresis loop. And then it stays there uh, in the absence of magnetic field. If they need to change information, they locally apply a large negative or a large positive field um, and um, flip the magnetization, flip the bit of information. So this is an example of, um, this is not a hard drive, but this is a, sort of in the same spirit data from IBM, um, who pioneered a lot of the hard drive uh, work. Uh, here we see a strip of uh, magnetic material, cobalt, cobalt alloy. Uh, so cobalt is a ferromagnet. Um, and uh, here it's a, of a very well-defined uh, uh, shape. It's a stripe. And domains that they form here are very regular. So as opposed to the domains I showed you that were random, these domains are very regular. And you can imagine that for any kind of technology, you do want that. You don't want random grains uh, in, a, in a storage medium, and then you don't know where to go to find the next bit of information. You want them to be in some kind of an organized fashion. And this is what you can do by playing with a shape of the magnet and also the crystalline quality uh, of it as well, um, you can uh, organize domains in such a way. And uh, this picture shows you the magnetization as a spatial map. So this is not a photograph. In the photograph, you are not sensitive to magnetization. This is a magnetic force microscopy image. And the way that technique works is here you have a sample with uh, anti-aligned domain configuration. Do so magnetization is pointing in the plane uh, in opposite directions. And that creates fringing magnetic fields. So each of these is a little magnetic dipole, which creates uh, its own fringing fields like this. And so field uh, will be uh, flipping direction uh, and also uh, oscillating a bit in magnitude. Uh, as you go along uh, this strip. Then what you do is you have a, a very light suspended vibrating object with a sharp tip. And this tip is uh, magnetic. So it feels the magnetic, uh, the magnetic field. And then depending on magnetic field orientation, uh, left or right, and on the strength, the tip will get a different amount of deflection. Uh, will get a different amount of deflection. Uh, and you can record the deflection of the tip with some kind of a sensor. So the deflection sensor is here. Um, and uh, make a map in space. So that's where the word force comes from. So you're measuring the force. You're measuring the deflection, which is proportional to force on this cantilever. But this is a magnetic force um, in this case. Or at least it, it has a component of magnetic force. Um, if the tip is not magnetic, you can still feel the, uh, the profile of this structure. That's called an atomic force microscope. And so there is also another force, atomic force, between the tip and the atoms. And you can actually see uh, individual uh, lattice sites uh, with this technique if you tune it very well. Um, typically, uh, it is very difficult to measure just a static force. So to, to see the tip deflect a little bit up and a little bit uh, get attracted a little bit down. So what people do uh, in these kind of microscopes in AFM, atomic force and MFM, they make the tip vibrate. So the tip vibrates and uh, it, it, is like an, it is like an oscillator, a driven oscillator. Uh, and you are detecting a, a signal uh, which is uh, at the same frequency 
Typically, this detector is a laser, so it bounces off of the other back surface of this tip into the detector, and by the modulation of the laser signal, you can uh, tell that it's vibrating at this frequency. And then when you add uh, some kind of an extra force, that frequency shifts a little bit. And the frequency of the vibration shifts, and you're detecting uh, this shift, or you can detect a phase of vibration changing, and this is how uh, you, uh, in practice, do uh, this measurement. And the reason for that is that um, if you do this uh, static force detection, then any random kicks in the environment, a truck passing in the street, uh, somebody sneezing, a fly flying by, um, any kind of event like this would distort, distort the image very strongly uh, because it will add some kind of a force and that will result in a in some kind of a extra signal here. But when you are looking at a certain frequency, uh, then you can filter out all the other frequencies and just focus on one frequency that you know is the vibration frequency of this cantilever. Uh, and then you're not sensitive to uh, many of these uh, spurious signals. So this is also behind uh, something that is called a lock-in technique. So you log into that frequency, and you uh, protect yourself from a lot of the uh, noise in the environment. This is a very powerful experimental technique. Uh, I use it in my lab a lot with electronic circuits, but this one is an example of a kind of a mechanical uh, lock-in. Okay. In the remaining time, I want to talk about something that is a little bit related to uh, the idea of this MFM. Uh, it is another high frequency technique uh, which is called uh, magnetic resonance. Uh, I will use the example of nuclear magnetic resonance today, but it equally well applies to a ferromagnet. In that case, it's called a ferromagnetic resonance. But there are many other varieties of the same phenomenon uh, which uh, all are united by the fact that you are driving a magnetic moment into some kind of a periodic oscillation by an external field. Typically, it's a magnetic field. Um, so the types of resonance are nuclear magnetic resonance, which has arguably the largest applications uh, in real life. Uh, but there is also uh, electronic spin resonance or paramagnetic resonance. Uh, and that's where you do the same stuff, but not with nuclear spins and a lattice, uh, but with electron spins. Uh, and you look, uh, this is a very useful technique for many of the chemistry uh, studies. Uh, then there's a ferromagnetic resonance where you take, a, for example, a single domain and treat this single domain as a magnetization, as a magnetic moment. And then by applying a, a high frequency field, you make this magnetic moment spin. So there are, you can imagine this uh, having some application also in information uh, storage or processing technology. Uh, as well. And there are more exotic types like spin wave resonance or anti-ferromagnetic resonance. Um, there are, I can continue this list. Uh, uh, there is an electric dipole spin resonance where uh, due to spin orbit interaction you can couple uh, spin to an electric field which is normally not possible but it has some technological advantages because electric fields are much easier to generate. Um, but these are, this is why we uh, care about this. And this is also not a complete list. This is a traditional list from your Kittel uh, textbook where you can study uh, the uh, surrounding of uh, spins. So uh, you can study what other spins are in the vicinity of a given spin. For example, a nuclear spin inside the material. Uh, and this is a foundation uh, not only for a lot of chemistry studies, but also for uh, magnetic resonance imaging. Right? So magnetic resonance imaging is a variety of NMR, of nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, and uh, it tells us about what kind of processes happen inside the tissues by looking at spins of um, nuclei. Uh, you can uh, look at um, interesting phenomena like collective spin excitations, 
in a spin wave resonance, you can uh, look at uh, dynamics of spins. That I will touch upon today a little bit. So you can look at what spins are out there, also at how they're evolving. Are they fluctuating? Are they stationary? This uh, tends to have a lot of uh, applications in quantum computing because uh, a lot of the concepts there are based on uh, using single spins for storage now of quantum information. And in this case, what happens next to a single spin can destroy that information. And uh, so knowing about the dynamics of other spins around uh, is very valuable. Okay, so this is a very uh, important phenomenon, spin resonance. Who is familiar with spin resonance already? Okay, great. So I have just the slides for you. Okay, there are two ways to uh, explain uh, spin resonance. And one of these ways is quantum mechanical, and the other way is classical. And we're going to go through both of them in different level of detail, but I hope you will appreciate both of them. Uh, and once again, uh, we will uh, focus on the nuclear type, but you can write the same thing for any magnetic moment spin or a magnetic domain or, um, or a nucleus. A nuclear is a canonical one where textbooks, a lot of textbooks are written about it. Um, and so, in the, uh, however, physics is very similar to spin, so you have a, a magnetic moment which is proportional to uh, the angular momentum uh, with some gyromagnetic ratio gamma, which is then different for electrons and spins. So, for example, uh, for uh, electrons, uh, this gyromagnetic ratio is um, about a thousand times larger than for uh, nuclei. Here it is given at the table at the, in the table at the bottom. A uh, gyromagnetic ratio um, for electron is in a 10 to the 7 range for this uh, second uh, Gauss. Uh, and for the proton, it's 10 to the 4. So the, all these magnetic properties for nuclei are much weaker, uh, but it is not uh, important for the general conceptual discussion. Uh, just like a spin of an electron, um, in a magnetic field, spin of a nucleus gets uh, an energy. Uh, and this energy is proportional to the magnetic moment and proportional to the magnetic field, and it's a dot product of the two. So if you apply magnetic field in the z direction and you wait long enough, then uh, magnetic moment of nucleus will also point in the z direction, especially at zero temperature. And this is what's uh, expressed here. Then... Uh, you, will, you can have, uh, in a general uh, case, uh, at finite temperature or at, at a fixed moment of time, which is not infinity, you can have a magnetic moment not aligned with um, uh, B0, and then uh, it will be characterized by projections uh, going from I to minus I uh, will be the uh, M projections on the Z-axis. Um, spin of uh, angular momentum of uh, nuclei uh, is not necessarily one half, right? A nucleus is made of a bunch of protons and neutrons, and each of those has spin one half. But the spin of a nucleus can easily be three halves, five halves, and so on. What's moreover, different isotopes of the same material can have different nuclear spins. And in the same uh, compound, where you melt together uh, different atoms, there could be different isotopes. So different isotopes can have different, uh, different spins. Uh, seven halves, nine halves are all possible. And then there are many Z projections uh, of this. But if we focus on uh, nuclear spin one half, so it make it really uh, identical to the situation of electron, except for this gamma here being much smaller. Then we know that in the magnetic field, 
you acquire Zeeman energy. And the two levels, uh, 1 half and minus 1 half, will split. Uh, minus 1 half will be at a higher energy. 1 half will be at a lower energy. And this splitting will be uh, gamma or uh, g mu b. So uh, for the g factor of 2, you'll have 2 mu b. And mu uh, is a concept derived from gamma. It's a called a nuclear magneton. Uh, and this is given here. And like I said, this is 2,000 times smaller than for an electron. Um, now, you have two of these energy levels. You can induce a transition from the lower energy level to the higher energy level. So to properly treat this, we have to uh, go for the time-dependent Schrodinger equation uh, with external driving. Uh, but to conceptualize this, uh, if you um, come in with a photon of energy h bar omega, you can absorb this photon and go from the lower energy state to a higher energy state. Or you can emit a photon and go from the higher energy state to a lower energy state. Uh, so there is some kind of an energy matching here where the energy of this uh, photon, h omega naught, should match the Zeeman energy splitting between the two levels. There is an energy matching, and that is, in essence, what spin resonance is. It's when the energy of your excitation, uh, now I gave you an example of a photon, but remember what a photon is. It is an electromagnetic wave. So this electromagnetic wave has a time-dependent magnetic field in it, and that magnetic field is a sinusoidal function of time and space. So you can think about this photon as imposing a time-dependent magnetic field, uh, which is oscillating at frequency omega naught. And when that frequency is such that h bar omega naught is equal to the Zeeman energy splitting, you will induce a transition, you will induce a spin flip. If you keep shining this frequency onto the system, it will flip back. So uh, this is something you get from time-dependent Schrodinger equation. If you uh, expose a two-level system to a periodic driving h bar omega, then if your eigenstate was, uh, your uh, spectral weight was fully in the ground state, it will go into the excited state and then back. The two probabilities will constantly oscillate like this. So this is the quantum mechanical view of the resonance. So the resonance condition is when omega naught is equal to gamma uh, B naught. So gamma B naught, the external magnetic field B naught. This is the, the simple quantum mechanical view. Um, this is all based on the concept of precession. And then again, uh, you can look at the precession from two points of view, from the quantum mechanical point of view and from a classical point of view. What unifies the two representations is this block sphere concept. Remember I told you that uh, you can represent a quantum mechanical state of spin as a sphere. So each point on the sphere is one of the possible states. Uh, the uh, north pole of the sphere would then be spin up. The south pole of the sphere will be a spin down. And then uh, a vector state will be uh, the a particular spin state. Uh, or you can say that that's the average magnetization. So if you measure it 1,000 times, you will get a magnetization pointing in this direction for this particular superposition of spin up and spin down. Uh, now, if you uh, now uh, start with some uh, arbitrary uh, state or ma average magnetization characterized by theta and phi, uh, you can think of it as a classical magnetic moment pointing in that direction. And if you apply now magnetic field external to the system in the z direction, like we did before, this magnetic moment will feel the torque from the field, and it will undergo this precession, which is also known as Larmor precession. 
uh, and uh, it will uh, follow this da dotted circle around the external field. And so if you uh, line up magnetization exactly in the xy plane, the circle will also live in the xy plane. You will precess with the maximum amplitude. However, the frequency of precession, uh, this Larmor frequency, is the same regardless of whether you're pointing this way, this way, uh, or down. So the, the uh, equations, the classical equations, how this precession occurs are, uh, this is the torque. Torque leads to a change in angular momentum, dj dt. And j is related to mu, the magnetization. So then you arrive to this equation that change in magnetization with time, this is a vector equation, is proportional to mu cross b. And then gamma b naught is the Larmor frequency. So if you solve this equation for a static b, uh, you will see that all components of magnetization precess in this fixed magnetic field. They undergo a precession. Okay. So we encountered this already when we studied um, uh, diamagnetism. Now I wanted to go in a little bit more detail um, into how this precession arises. So here is the same uh, equation for uh, the magnetic moment precessing. And we can also replace this mu with m, which is the magnetization of a bulk sample like we saw today. Inside the ferromagnetic domain, for example, m will be just n times mu, the number of spins, the number of sites in, uh, in that domain. And so for the uh, uh, now bulk magnetization capital M, we can write a similar equation. And we can also add some realistic terms here. They are proportional to T1 and T2, which are two uh, relaxation times. Uh, so you can see the meaning of this term. The first term just gives you a um, precession. So it's uh, proportional to the uh, cross product. So it's a little bit similar to the Lorentz force. It's always tangential to your motion of m. Uh, but these two guys are proportional to mz or m perpendicular, which is mx plus my, m perpendicular is mxx plus my y. Sorry for the scribble here. Um, and so uh, with these rates, 1 over t1 and 1 over t2, uh, the uh, magnetization will tend to fall onto the z-axis. Uh, or t this one, the m perpendicular, will disappear because of the minus sign here. And so these are called relaxation and dephasing. Uh, and by just measuring these two numbers, you can learn a lot about uh, materials. So now what happens on resonance uh, is the following thing. You uh, have this Larmor precession going. So here is the, the cartoon for that, for example. You apply a static magnetic field. And around that field, uh, you have Larmor precession. Uh, now imagine that in addition to that static field, you apply a high frequency changing field, oscillating field. And you apply it on resonance in the following sense. When the precession is going towards me, I help it by canting the field this way. So it goes faster towards me. And when it starts to go away from me, I cant the total field away so it goes faster away from me. And so I sort of pump in energy into this uh, precession. And the analogy here is uh, like a child uh, on a swing set. So when the swing swings towards you uh, and starts to go back, you push the child. And then uh, you do it every time at the same time and with the same periodicity as the natural swing frequency. You can pump in a lot of energy and increase the amplitude of the oscillation. So what that uh, does in this case, that when uh, spin precesses by half a period, you 
then help it and you accelerate it, accelerate it, and all these rotations add up to spin actually flipping after a few of these revolutions. And then it starts to flip back. So this is the classical view of spin resonance, the same as the quantum mechanical, but this is a, from the classical dynamics point of view. If you do it off resonance, so you have a Larmor frequency going, but the frequency of the external drive is different, then uh, sometimes you will counteract this precession, and you will never uh, precess out of this confined area uh, here. You will never flip the spin because you are sometimes uh, pushing the swing when it is swinging towards you, you're pushing it back and you're taking energy away from the system. So you're not, uh, you're not on resonance. But this is just a simplified example of that. I told you that typically it's easier to generate uh, sinusoidal fields, uh, but uh, it is easier to understand spin resonance uh, when you have a square field which just changes sign with a constant amplitude for periods of time. So when, when this periodicity is the same as the Larmor frequency, so when this period is 2 pi over omega naught, the Larmor frequency, then what happens is the blue uh, curve. You go half a period and then you get a kink which makes you rotate around this field and then you rotate this way then you get a kink which makes you rotate around this field and you spin further down and you uh, cover the entire uh, block sphere this way if you do it off resonance the kinks just cancel each other and you always stick around the the north pole of the block sphere and so this is also a principle behind uh, uh, quantum bit operation which we will cover in subsequent lectures uh, and this is also the principle behind MRI, NMR, uh, ESR, EPR, and all these other resonance phenomena. And in general, for any, any kind of system uh, which has two quantum levels and is exposed to periodic driving, this kind of picture applies. So I hope uh, you remember uh, this picture. Now, what is the effect of these times T1 and T2? Well, let's just start with T1 uh, and see uh, maybe that's already enough for today. Um, suppose you could detect which way magnetization is pointing. For example, you are, have a ferromagnet, you are driving the resonance and magnetization rotates, and you have another RF coil sensitive to that field of that ferromagnet, and you can uh, measure... Uh, what happens inside. Uh, so let's say you can measure MY, the Y direction magnetization. Uh, so in an ideal system, it will just go on forever, precessing from up to down or from left to right um, under the influence of RF drive, of RF frequency externally imposed. But if you add relaxation, so that other term in the block equation, uh, then this oscillation will decay after time, which is the relaxation time, so say T1. And that's because there is a, a term here that prefers to collapse spin onto Z axis. So it doesn't let it freely precess, but because of interactions with some other spins around, uh, some kind of fluctuating fields, uh, or some kind of energy relaxation process interaction with a phonon, uh, or a photon, or an electron flying by, uh, you have a tendency to uh, just lose the energy and uh, go to the lowest energy state, which is Z. Uh, and so your dynamics might be this kind of a spiral, which uh, inevitably leads you towards Z. And in this case, uh, MY becomes zero. So the, the out-of-plane magnetization, the in-plane magnetization uh, shrinks. If you Fourier transform... Uh, this kind of sinusoidal function, you will get a, a delta function like we've seen before. There is only one frequency, right? In the frequency domain, there is only one spectral line. If you Fourier transform something that decays like this, you will get a similar function, but it will have a finite line width. And so this line width is then proportional to 1 over the relaxation time. 
So you can uh, actually sweep a frequency, sweep the RF frequency uh, of your drive, and measure the line width and tell what kind of relaxation time you're dealing with. That from that you could re reconstruct perhaps which spins are interacting. So here is the last slide for today. One example, a water molecule. So it has uh, uh, protons that are two angstroms apart. You can figure out what would be the magnetic field for two uh, magnetic dipoles that are uh, two angstroms apart. Uh, from the dipole formula, which is approximately uh, one over r cube. That's just classical uh, physics here. Um, you can figure out that the magnetic field felt by one proton due to the other is about two gauss. Right? And then you do the NMR spectrum uh, on this molecule and you get the line width which is just two gauss times the gyromagnetic ratio of uh, uh, of a proton. So uh, the axes are not here, but the point of this picture is that this line would be then consistent with this field. Now, why is that? It's because the two magnetic dipoles in the molecule can fluctuate between, let's say, plus minus two gauss, and that gives you some kind of shift in the resonance condition. OK, we stop here. We pick up on Thursday with um, many body physics of uh, magnetic systems.